What we're presenting here is the reflection, but by no means the, the perfect reflection of a process we've recently gone through engaging 100 experts in utility regulations. We gathered most of them together in a meeting to kick it off. We broke into six working groups on things like transmission, market structure, uh, the utility business model, and so forth. Each of them produced a paper, and Sonia and I wrote an overview paper. So we've, we've, we've tried hard to reach out um, and gather a lot. Um, we're also very much cognizant that the utility world is heterogeneous uh, in America and beyond America, and there is emphatically no one size fits all. But what I think we present here will have apl applicability in most venues. So with those caveats, let me begin. Um, the first point is one that you're all familiar with, but I'm not sure people fully understand its impact, um, which is that we have grasped a hold of the Holy Grail. In my entire professional life, the Holy Grail, there were many of them, but one of them was solar at a dollar a watt. Um, and it's now 60 cents or 70 cents or something like that. Um, uh, uh, wind energy prices, as everyone knows, have dropped by roughly half. The speed of deployment in jurisdictions that take this seriously has been absolutely dramatic. Uh, Germany is now a quarter powered by renewable energy, Denmark 40%. It's not just that these are important numbers, but they change so quickly. Germany was about 6% renewables just over a decade ago. Um, so we have nonlinear scary phenomena in climate change. We need nonlinear hopeful phenomena in revamping the system. Um, the world can change extremely quickly. Technology can help that happen. But even as we see that good news, what I fear is that we're on the verge of, of snatching defeat from the jaws of victory. And this takes us emphatically to utility regulations. When you get this kind of disruptive technology change, it impinges very much on the utility business model, uh, and it requires radically rethinking the way we run our grids. And as far as I can tell, there's not a single, a single regulatory system in the world designed to deal with that. Um, and the problems start to hit at around 20, 25, 30% renewables, highly variable renewables. So we may see a ceiling on progress rather than the beginnings of, of what we desire, which is a clean energy future, a clean and affordable and reliable energy future. It's precisely this question that motivated this project. The National Renewable Energy Laboratory did this study you've all seen about uh, showing, arguing that it's possible to get 80% renewables by 2050 on the electricity grid in America. Um, they, they did this over 134 balancing areas using an hour by hour model. It's a, it's a really nice piece of work. But the how isn't part of that work, wasn't supposed to be part of that work. A similar study was done in Europe called Euro 2050 and had remarkably similar conclusions, which makes sense because the laws of physics obtain on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, and there's a study now underway in China to the same point. Uh, in all these jurisdictions and more, we have to reinvent utility regulation in order to incent new operating functions because without these new operating functions, the system crashes. When you get technology change, you get economic disruption. And economic disruption is emphatically underway in the utility sector. Um, what's happening in m areas where the utility prices, wholesale el electricity prices are set by the market, is you're putting a lot of technologies into the market that have zero marginal cost. And that drives down the price. At the same time, in those markets, most people make most of their money a few hours of the day. Um, you're, you're, you're exposing nuclear power to low rates much of the day and high rates for a few hours of the day and then back to low rates. When you dispatch zero marginal cost technologies into that market, you eliminate a lot of those high rates and everybody's cash flow goes away or, or gets in trouble. Um, in Germany, utilities profits have been driven to zero uh, or very close and so they're trying to divest not out of this power plant or that power plant, but out of their country and into other countries. And actually, if you take the utility away, as I will argue shortly, you encounter enormous problems. Or if you deprive the utility of the ability to deploy capital on behalf of society, on behalf of the electricity system, you create big, cap big problems. So you need, a, you need a system that rewards investment. But it's a different kind of in investment. And it's not the kind of investment that's going to repatriate capital in a marginal cost market. Um, so this is, this is absolutely a crucial point. Let me just, uh, let me just give a, a quick example of it, which this cycle is supposed to, to show. You've now taken the rent out of uh, wholesale markets. 
Um, at the same time, utilities are facing higher fixed costs, partly because they've deferred capital deployment for almost two decades since the publication in 1994 of the Blue Book in California. It, for, it radically foreshortened utilities' investment horizons. So fixed costs are rising, demand is flat to declining, and profits in the wholesale market are going away. And when that happens, you have to raise rates to stay even. But at the same moment you're raising rates, you're giving customers options to walk away. And your best customers walk fastest. And the customers in the most progressive utility districts with the steepest rate blocks walk first. So now you're in a system with declining volumes, rising rates, and customers walking away. And what do you do? For some, you go to war with your own customers, right? You try to prohibit them from self-generating. Or you tell them if they self-generate, they're going to do so at a different rate. They sell electrons to you at a different rate than you buy electrons from them. Um, and so David Crane recently said uh, with an with a expression of delight on his face since he's a disruptor that this is, quote, a mortal threat to the utility business model. And the Edison Electric Institute has um, also considered this a grave threat, although they don't have the same smile of delight on their faces. Um, so here we are with solar cheap, with penetration rates in the low single digits, and it's being called the greatest threat to the utility system. That's a ceiling on our ability to get things done if we don't deal with it quickly. Um, so uh, the, some people have called this a vicious spiral, others call it a death spiral. But the utility industry is not going to love this future under current regulations. And you really don't want the utility industry fighting this off. Um, but, so that's the economic scary part. Let me mention now the physical scary part. This is what they call the duck chart in California. And it's projections of net demand as a function of time, I think on a March day, I can't remember. Um, and let me explain this chart a little bit. The top cluster of lines is the capacity that California generators have to put into the system in order to meet demand. And it's a typical demand chart. It's, you know, it goes, it goes down at 2 in the morning and it rises into the afternoon. The bottom of that chart is the net demand circa 2018 or 2020 as the full California RPS comes into effect. And in a way, this is great news. Re variable renewables are whacking off a huge part of our electricity system. It's exactly what an RPS is designed to do. But look at the, s look at the slope of the lines from hours 17 to 20. That's what, 5 o'clock to 8 o'clock. Um, it's a dramatic increase in power that has to be generated in a very short amount of time. You've reduced, in other words, you've reduced energy load through renewables but you've dramatically increased the requirement to dispatch power. And the market doesn't reward people for doing that. Uh, and it's very tricky to build a market that rewards people for doing that. So if we don't find a way to d dispatch a lot of power very quickly, California's in trouble. Now California has already signed contracts to meet its 2020 RPS of 33%, with a significant buffer. There's now talk of going to 40%. But if you can't solve this problem for the California ISO, which is a very conservative institution, as reliability institutions are wont to be, we're not going to get there. Um, and so this is precisely the kind of problem we have. We have a leader state stuck its neck out, starting when Governor Brown was around the first time, uh, and ever since, um, facing a physical problem. The utilities are facing an economic problem, and the um, grid is facing a physical problem. We have to deal with both of these in order to win. Um, so, what does that mean? Um, the, 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 the first thing that has to be done in finding an answer to these problems is to debunk a couple of myths um, and argue for alternatives. And this is where the NREL study and the Euro 2050 study are terrifically useful. Most people think that in order, if you have variable power supply, you need to offset that with storage on a one-to-one -one basis. It turns out that there are about five things you need to do of which storage is the least. Um, and then this is, this is back to the NREL study. The, the, uh, the, the first thing, again, this will be familiar to everybody in this room, is you expand the area over which you try to balance your electricity system. The smaller the area, the more trouble you have with variability. And the covariance of like sources, like onshore wind, drops dramatically as you expand geography. And then if you add 
many kinds of renewables, some geothermal, some biomass, some onshore wind, some offshore wind, some photovoltaics, some solar thermal, some hydro into a system, you can very significantly deal with the, um, deal with the problem of, of variability. In order for that to happen, you have to build transmission wires. And you have to repatriate capital for transmission wires in order to build transmission wires. And hour by hour markets don't get you there. They emphatically will not cause that to happen. So the cheapest thing to do, every model has shown, is to expand your balancing areas with new transmission and efficient ways to move electricity. We're not there in terms of how to do that, although we're getting there. And, and the FERC, I, I have to say, has, has played an amazing leadership role on this front. The second item is on the demand side, not surprisingly. Anybody in the, everybody in this room has understood the potential of efficiency for a long time. But we need now to make efficiency happen in a dispatchable way. It has to happen um, as, as an energy saver over time. That's what a demand side management program does by changing light bulbs and insulating houses and so on. But it also has to happen in an instantaneous way to deal with that sharp, sharp curve of, of net demand required. Dispatchable efficiency is known as demand response. Um, PJM, you probably heard this last time around, has, has, has proven that this can be a big deal. Most ISOs don't believe it yet, right? They like things with switches on them. These things have switches, but it's, it's the random adolescence problem. You do you really believe they're going to turn them all on at the same time? I like this theme, Reed. Um, the, the next one is valuing flexibility. Natural gas turbines are a terrific way to meet transient power demands. They're an okay way to meet energy demands. They're okay because they still have quite a bit of carbon. Um, but if you need something quick, go get it with a gas turbine. You may as well use an efficient gas turbine. Both GE and Siemens now have gas turbines that reach combined cycle efficiencies of around 60% with 30 minute ramp rates. These are amazing technologies. They're not cheap technologies. And the current regulatory system is not rewarding people for building these technologies. So that's something you have to repair. But I tell you, it's a whole lot cheaper to build a natural gas turbine than to build that many batteries. Um, and from a carbon perspective, it doesn't really matter if you're running it 200 hours a year or 400 hours a year. It's, in the, it's totally in the noise. Um, I hope batteries become super cheap or storage options become super cheap. But there's absolutely no reason to hold our breath until that happens. So you need markets that put flexibility into the system. Um, storage technologies, totally in favor of those. And the NREL model argues for 100 gigawatts of storage. About that. No. Uh, it's a big number. They don't really say how we're going to get there. There's some interesting new ideas. We should push very hard. We, don't, we, don't, we shouldn't rely on them. And, and as you, you, your, your article argues that that's, they're not necessary. You can, deal with, you, you can also do this with overcapacity on the renewable side, which we'll hear about. Um, and finally, and in some ways most important, you need somebody in the system who's motivated to optimize all these variables against each other. And that somebody doesn't exist right now. In the old days, a vertically integrated utility would optimize supply side through very, very smart dispatch rules and would optimize transmission and distribution and would report to a public authority, the Public Service Commission. They never were asked to optimize energy efficiency until the last couple decades. They have not yet been asked to optimize demand response. Um, storage has been in the noise. Uh, and, and the idea of looking across balancing areas happened because of jurisdictional questions rather than because this was the smartest economical or physical thing to do. So whose job is that? Where do they come from? And how do we motivate them? So to get there, we did the following. We said, no matter what your market is, and remember, we're trying to come up with a set of solutions that's applicable to the incredibly heterogeneous world in which utilities exist in America. From Texas all-out deregulation to Tennessee, the government, Southern Company, and the PUC control everything, um, to, to everything in between. 